Okay, thank you for uh, bearing up with me. So I'm going to talk about building multiplayer game backends uh, on AWS Lambda. Uh, yeah, let's let's get to it. Initially, there there was supposed to be another talker to this talk. Richard uh, helped me with setting up an SBT project to work with CDK, which stands for Cloud Development Kit. So that was the part that he was. Uh, uh, supposed to talk about, but he's uh, awaiting uh, a birth of his son. So yeah, he's with his wife now. Good luck to you, Richard, and your uh, baby. My name is Łukasz Michniewicz. I work as a server engineer in a company called Endreams. Uh, we are a company of over 200 talented folks split in different uh, uh, <coughs> departments like game design, art, programming, production, and yeah, we are a gaming company. We make uh, premium AAA quality uh, VR games exclusively, and we are split in four studios. The studio that I work in is uh, like focused on exploring new modes of interactions in VR, including like social ones. Uh, okay, like the, our mostly, most acclaimed uh, critically game is Fract, so uh, if you are into VR, definitely check it out. It's about climbing and shooting and shooting from heights, and yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> okay, so I, I had some doubts if I should show the next slide, because the next slide contains QR code for a demo app, and I might have slightly underestimated <laughs> a number of people who would use it, so I'm pretty sure it's gonna crash, but we can watch it burn, and then take a look into the logs and see like what uh, what went wrong. So there we have it. I, I will do it too with you to make sure that uh, <laughs> it works. Okay, so. I will know in a moment if like, oh yeah, I, I see other geese. And I, I kind of wanted to show you, you know, this on the big screen, but like my laptop is not connected and I don't want to like, but you get an idea. It's a simple game client that's exchanging location through the backend. And uh, yeah, I see a lot of geese standing still, so <laughs> probably that's where it crashed now, but yeah. Anyway, it worked for a moment. We can uh, take a look later at the logs, and it's, it's not really important for the later part of the talk. Uh. All right, so what we are looking at was like a Unity game client uh, that is stored in S3 bucket. It's just like a file that you download to your browser and it opens it up and like starts a WebGL context and displays all of this nice stuff. And it talks to a API gateway. It's like a, an AWS Lambda uh, API gateway and exchanges messages through the web sockets. Uh, you can take a look at the protocol later uh, from the logs if you want. And like, Straight out of, uh, out of the API gateway, it's uh, passing the messages to, to the Lambda. Mm, for, you, for, for those of you who don't know what AWS Lambda is, I will uh, tell it in a moment. Uh, long story short, it's like a piece of code that's running somewhere on a server. Uh, and yeah, this message, it simply puts the records that it receives into Kinesis data stream. And Kinesis is like a message broker. It's kind of similar to Kafka. And uh, yeah, and, and you can use it to queue your messages in your system. Uh, then it triggers a game state processor. This is like the main Lambda, which has the state of locations of all the connected players. And yeah, it, it just like does the dispatching. And the way that you respond to WebSocket in AWS uh, uh, serverless architecture is like you make an HTTP post call to a new URL that configuration gives you. And I have like slight uh, suspicion that this might be kind of slow operation, you know, like making HTTP post calls. So 
I, I don't really know like where are the bottlenecks, you know, in this uh, whole system. Yeah, I kind of like when I started the project, the only requirement is like, yeah, we have to do this on AWS Lambda because we don't have DevOps engineers. So every infrastructure you, you are going to need, you have to build yourself. <laughs> so here we are. Um, yeah, so like with AWS Lambda, you can start like really simple, you know, push your system to the limits, which might not be very far as we could saw, you know, like just a minute ago. And then you can just like extend it. Uh, so you can add persistence to your systems and like all the kind of CQRS stuff, like right side, read side, different tables for different queries and so on. And now like what if I told you that you can provision all of this infrastructure simply by using a Scala code and like not waiting for <laughs> DevOps, you know, to provision it for you. So what is a CDK? AWS CDK lets you build reliable, <laughs> cost-effective applications in the cloud with the considerable expressive power of programming language, which means you can provision uh, your infrastructure with one of these uh, languages, like Scala being one of them, but the support is not uh, ideal. Yeah, but we will get into that. So like a top abstraction of CDK is an app, like as in many other frameworks. An app is an aggregate for stacks. And stacks in return can, uh, can aggregate other stacks, and they can also model relations between them. And they can be nested, like whenever you create a stack, you provide a parent to it, and parent can be either an app or another stack, so that's how the nesting works. And uh, stacks are constructed from constructs, and construct would be something like Lambda function, API gateway, uh, Kinesis data stream, whatever you, like one of those boxes that you saw on a diagram would be a construct in your uh, infrastructure as Scala code, right? Oh yeah, and you can like take, for example, one construct from one stack and pass it as a dependency to another stack, and Scala type system will kind of take care that it really connects to each other, right? So once you compile your infrastructure as code code, you are pretty confident that it's going to at least deploy. And so for example, this is like a, this is as much code you need to actually create a Lambda function, which is, you know, like serverless server running somewhere with a package of your code executed. Uh, okay, so now let's take a look, like if we wanted to write our Lambda code in Scala, what would it take? Uh, first of all, we need to consider very specific nature of Lamb AWS Lambda execution. So you have no guarantee that when you make a request that the Lambda is actually alive, it will uh, like stand up and start if it's not which will incur additional time. So that's why you need to take care that your services are like really fast to you know, get up because you don't want a player to you know, like user waiting 60 seconds because before they can start interact interacting with the system, right? Uh, so yeah, it's just a piece of code ex executed on demand somewhere. It's ephemeral in nature. It might die you know, like five minutes after the last request or like 30 seconds, you never know. And yeah, that's why you need to take extra care that your application starts quickly because you are built flat per invocation. So there is like a very small fee for every uh, fact that you run, started your Lambda and then you also pay for as long it goes. So like support of a Scala out of the box in uh, AWS Lambda is like the one of a Java, so you would have to deal, you know, with those so-called, like I, I found it in one of the tutorials, like Javaisms, and I like that term. Uh, so you would have to do like a conversion of collections, uh, back and forth, like does not support case classes if you wanted to use it in your Lambda handler, because like Lambda is simply a handler that will receive some kind of a JSON uh, to it. And then it's like up to you how you are going to deserialize it. And by default, it's being deserialized by Jackson, which you might exchange for something nicer like Kirke. And well, in general, I would say it's like suboptimal Scala developer experience definitely wasn't something that I was looking into when I pitched Scala to the team, right? So 
Uh, I found this very nice library that I want to uh, give a shout out to an author. It's called like AWS Lambda Scala, <laughs> which gives, gives you like a very small uh, compatibility layer uh, with which you can, you know, achieve like a nice, uh, yeah, it, it integrates with Kirke first of all, uh, and it gives you like a native Scala developer experience, you know, something that I really like to work with, uh, like from the start. Uh, okay, so like I decided for ACA for this project because kind of for some operations we would need to uh, like have a log of so-called significant player actions, right? So in game design those would be the actions that change the player state in a significant way, basically like an accounting for a virtual world, right? Uh, so of course we needed a persistence. And like for me and many of you, like the default choice for ACA persistence would be Cassandra, and you can provision a Cassandra cluster in AWS. Although when I when I did it and I built you know like a simple actor system that used uh, Cassandra persistence, like GDBC driver was like very high heavy weight to start up. I think like. I had to really increase the, all the timeouts because such a lambda would start in a minute or more, so it was completely unacceptable. So, like a default data store for up and only operations is a DynamoDB in AWS Lambda. And yeah, again, you need like a library to, to make it compatible with ACA because it does not provide you know, the support out of the box. I think there was like a kind of semi-official project, but I decided for this one because I think it worked nicer. Anyway, like if you want to run Akka in uh, AWS Lambda, I definitely can recommend that. Uh, makes uh, integration with your database so much easier. Mm. All right, so like out of the box, both Java and Scala will not start very quickly. And this is due to like use of JVM and not executing the code natively. So uh, yeah, here comes GraalVM to the rescue. And GraalVM, and specifically GraalVM native image, is a project which aims to match the performance of native languages and reduce the startup time for JVM languages by compiling them ahead of time. Exactly what we wanted. <laughs> Unfortunately, the process of Graal VMizing your lambdas, it's uh, not the, straight, the most straightforward one, but definitely worth doing. And this is really something that does not make much sense to benchmark because once you've done it, like the difference is so noticeable. Like in this case, you know, like a simple ACA system with persistence running on with Cassandra JDBC driver, more than a minute to start, like GraalVM native image with ACA persistence DynamoDB library, which essentially is like lightweight HTTP client, like starts under two minutes, uh, two seconds, I'm sorry. And the same goes for warm up execution time, you know, when the Lambda has a chance to run a little bit, so maybe some caching in the CPU, you know, starts filling up. And yeah, this is also very noticeable, like an order of magnitude uh, faster with Graal VM. Like memory consumption, again, uh, so, so much less used. And like even Lambda package size, you know, for JVM that would be like over 250 megabytes and Graal VM native image is like really slim. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's really fast to send from your pipeline to, to AWS. Okay, and I wanted to talk about this because like from in this work where I had to set up some kind you know, of a framework for deploying a game backend uh, on AWS Lambda, making it compatible with uh, GraalVM took the most time for me. You know? so, I came up with like a semi-automated or like automated process that can be automated in a built pipeline for collecting uh, reflection configurations. And the reflection configuration is something important because like in Java you can basically synthesize a class name and request instantiation of this class. Like uh, even though compiler did, did not know anything about it, you cannot do that in GraalVM. You have to declare any kind of you know reflective access to your classes and you are doing that by providing a JSON configuration, right? And so 
if you want to generate this uh, JSON configuration instead of like crafting it by hand, there is a way to do that. It's called GraalVM Native Image Agent. And it simply will run your JVM app and like collect any configuration automatically. So what you could do is like you can, sim you, you can just build a regular Uber jar from your SBT project with SBT assembly plugin. Then you would uh, prepare a special Docker image containing the GraalVM native uh, tooling. You would run this, uh, instantiating a container. Then you would, ex you would put it under some kind of uh, test, you know, like uh, you would call some HTTP or WebSocket me methods of your container, just to make sure that every uh, execution path that you are interested in which is perfect, in perfect words, like all of them, if you have a good test uh, coverage. Because you want to make sure that every part of your code runs, so the native uh, image agent can collect, you know, all of the information that it needs. And, yeah, you would get this, those files uh, in the end through the volume mount, uh, so they stay on the host system, and then you can copy them back to your SBT project, and then finally you can run your package lambda function uh, SBT task, which is basically like running this Graal VM uh, ahead of time compilation, and it, ha it should have at this point all the configuration it needs. Uh, yeah, the following slides will be slightly technical, but I just wanted you know, to signal w what kind of stuff you need to do in order to be build this uh, Docker image, so you, you can base it on and the one provided by, uh, for Java 11 by AWS. You have to, of course, like install your uh, tooling. Uh, you have to override your JVM environment. Uh, that's how you provide the path where uh, the code will be uh, generated. And then you override an entry point that, yeah. So this is also, like again, open sourced uh, entry point for re regular uh, Lambda container, uh, what you have to do here is also like override the um, Java environment. There is just like a one pro of having, uh, you know, Graal in your project, and it's like execution speed, which is matched like in AWS Lambda with those of Golang or C Sharp, or .NET, I'm sorry. Uh, but it has a bunch of cons. Like, uh, it's not a single time cost, but rather it's like a constant slowing down factor, like especially at the beginning of the project when you are still adding new dependencies and every time you do that it will just like fail because you have not generated like the reflection configuration. Which you do with additional build step that you have to prepare, right? And some things just won't work and this is simply because of the complexity. Like I, I would never want it to like Graal VMizing the Spring Boot project, for example. I, Maybe it can be done, like a special legacy one, but it just seems like a lot of work, and uh, yeah. And also, like once you go for Graal VM, you have to disable Java serialization for Akka, and you have to provide your own. So it adds some work, but it's, in my opinion, like uh, totally essential to have in a uh, Lambda environment if you want to write Java or Scala. And speaking of Serial, custom serialization. I really wanted to thank you. Like I know that people from Virtus Lab are here, and I found this library, and it's like really a uh, good thing to have. It's like super easy to use. The only thing I think you you have to uh, taint your code with is like extension from circa Aka serial ser serializable trait, and yeah, uh, I can recommend it as well. And there is like another library. So, so this is a library of Graal VM reachability metadata, which also contains like reflection configuration, and it does this for like most commonly used Java libraries. Uh, and yeah, it's also like a huge help. If you cannot figure out, you know, how to make the netty work, you just like download this bunch of JSON files, you put it into your project, and it should work. All right, so like in summary, <laughs> I started this by showing you, you know, very simple demo uh, with very simple architecture, which is not very scalable. I'm sorry about that. Uh, next time I will do better. And you kind of can see why, because, you know, it's like there is some message uh, 
queuing, but at the end there is like no fan out, so you don't have like multiple uh, game state processors, and you could have that. So that's one of the reasons why you would put Kinesis data stream because then you can fan this out into multiple lambdas. And, and yeah, so that that was it. <laughs> Then we talked a little bit, you know, how we can extend uh, an ACA system with uh, DynamoDB as a backend. Uh, I touched just a little bit, you know, on how to write uh, CDK code with Scala. And yeah, how to optimize your Scala lambdas with GraalVM. So it, it was like a very general talk, you know, like each of those points could be a talk on its own, but uh, yeah. I hope you enjoyed it or find it informative, and that's all I had to tell you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I think the geese won, so <laughs> the geese were cool. All right, do we have questions? No? Yeah, there is a one. Hi, uh, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, my question is about uh, your choice of uh, ACA um, and uh, in particular ACA persistence uh, within the Lambda. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was, um, uh, well, um, well, I'm asking because um, uh, the frequent reason why people go for uh, ACA uh, is that uh, the model can be held in memory uh, so to reduce uh, latency. Mm -hmm. uh, but in case of lambdas, uh, that seems to not to be the case, right? Because, well, the lambdas uh, will live for a short while and then get killed. So uh, I was wondering, um, well, what, were, what were your primary reasons to use this technology there? Okay, I can tell you, like, mostly it's a personal, uh, like a personal, limitation that we have on all of our backend that we have to build for this game. I mean, the example that I decided to show might have been a bit unfortunate because we won't be dealing with uh, real-time data like location that changes quickly. Uh, what I'm building is more like an accounting system for virtual world. So there would be like one or two maybe requests, you know, from a player just to update the state. And I decided for Aka because it gives a lot of stuff out of the box. So as you said, like uh, Lambda, you know, s lives and dies, you know, uh, quite uh, randomly. So every time it dies and starts again, you can restore the state from, from the Aka journal log, right? Uh, and in, and as essentially this works. I, I kind of start seeing, you know, the limitations of the system, like it does not run very fast, but we might be fine with that, you know, in the end, uh, since, like, as I said, we won't be dealing with data, data that changes rapidly. Um. Hank, uh, I've got two strictly practical questions. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is uh, that <coughs> uh, when it comes to the license model of ACA, aren't you afraid of the cost associated with per core pricing if you use Lambda? Like, so I was. Do you mean like the last change with Lambda ACA 2.7 that Lambda. they changed the? Sorry. Yes, the, the license change, and so now the pricing is per core. Uh, and per core doesn't like Lambda at all. Like mm. you can have an unlimited number of cores in theory. So this is well, not yeah, I don't plan to go for Aka 2.7. And the promise from I think like the Lightband or who's developing that, yeah, is that they they will provide like security updates for version 2.6. And like really, I mean. I'm going to use such a small subset of Akka, and I went for it mostly because it gave me this like persistence from the log and even sourcing, you know, like off, out of the box. And uh, I might consider changing it for something else, but uh, yeah. Uh. Okay, so j just a heads up. Uh, okay, mm -hmm. and the other question I have also <laughs> when it comes to practical and financial issues: mm -hmm. uh, when you use API Gateway for a web socket. Isn't it a little costly? Like uh, you pay per time consumed, as far as I remember. So not per request, mm -hmm. and it's a little costly, as, as far as I remember. Well, this whole you know aspect of how much is gonna cost, I think is gonna be explored. <laughs> uh, 
as I said, like for now, this is something I have to work with because we basically as a company which does single player games up to this point, mostly we do not have simply a people to, you know, build our own infrastructure. So if this, if this proves to be too expensive, you know, to run on AWS serverless, we will hire someone to build the ar needed architecture, right? Call us, but we will help. <laughs> Oh, by the way, we are hiring DevOps engineers. <laughs> Talk to me if you are one. All right.